going to be talking to you a little bit about the Old English poetic conventions or the things that you can expect to see in poetry. Some of the techniques and stylistic things that they do in Old English poetry, which can be helpful for interpreting that poetry. The very first thing that I'm going to talk with you about is Anglo-Saxon alliteration, which relies on the Anglo-Saxon meter, which is organized into half lines. So you can see I've put a space here to indicate the pause or what's known as a cesura, a pause or cesura in the middle of the line. The lines are separated by half lines, but then they're joined by alliteration, which is the repetition of the first sound, the initial sound in a word. And in Anglo-Saxon, all vowels alliterate with each other. So in this example, we have here this G alliterating with this G. We have this S alliterating with this S and with this S. So you will have one or two alliterative words in the first half line or the A line, and you'll have usually just one, but sometimes two in the second half line or the B line. Now here we have vowels. So I alliterates with Y, alliterates with I, alliterates with U, because all the vowels alliterate together. Y basically functions as a vowel in Old English. The last alliterating words here, nuis, alliterates with no and nu. This is one of the central characteristics of Anglo-Saxon literature. They call it alliterative verse. It is verse that relies on alliteration rather than rhyme. You'll notice end rhyme is not a thing. They do not care about rhyme at this point. That is not yet a convention of, Ang of poetry in English. Instead, alliteration is what drives the meter of the Anglo-Saxon poem. The next technique or convention that I want to tell you about are both apposition and variation. So the first one is variation. Variation is repetition, but with little changes, right, that offer more detail or more information. So here, I, 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 this song or tale, sing or make about me, very sad, about my own journey. So about me, very sad, about my own journey. This is a variation of the same phrase, about me, about my journey, but they're each slightly different. So they're renaming or retelling and they're giving us more information, but with a repeating, but with a slight difference. So be me for yamara min rasil frasith. Right, so repetition with slight changes to offer more detail or information is variation. The other convention on this slide is apposition, and I've mentioned this before, but to put something in apposition to something else is to rename the original person or thing. So in this case, the original is ich, which would be I over here, and win las recha. I'm a win las recha. I'm a, I'm a friendless wretch, an exile. Friendless Exile renames I, so it's in apposition to I. All right, the next set of conventions I'm going to talk to you about is compounding and cannings. So these are both two related items. So compounding is something that you're going to see a lot in German and English. We do this a lot in a number of languages. And in this case, it's for poetic effect, where you put two different words to, together to create something that's more descriptive. And in this case, we're still working with the Weiss Lament. Here we have lines five through eight. But we have a Rech Sitha. So these are two words that have been put together. Rech is essentially a wretch, right? That's what the word becomes. But it means sorrows or sadnesses or terrible things. So it's sorrow and then Sitha's journeys, right? So a, a journey is one thing, but a sorrow journey means that it's this terrible, horrible thing that you have to endure. It's different than just a journey. Likewise, down here in this example, ut kera. Ut is dawn, and kera is care or anxiety, right? So I had dawn concern. So that's not just regular concern. That's the kind of concern that wakes you up in the morning and makes you scared. That's the kind of concern that's in the early morning terrifying moment. And here we have Leo Truma. So my, my lord first, my first lord. So my first lord is my husband, for example, maybe like my first lord. So this is, this is an example then of compounding. There's a particular kind of compounding called a kenning. And a kenning is essentially a condensed metaphor. It's two words that are compounded, but into a new poetic way of describing a third word. So it's not just kind of an adjective tacked on to something like a sorrow journey or a dawn care, but it's actually two words that together make a third word. So in the examples I've got here, worth mindum, worth here is 
worth. And mindum, you can see mind kind of hiding in there, and then um means of the. So essentially, so worth of the mind or mind worth. What's mind worth? If you think someone is worthy in your mind or the worth that people attribute to you in their minds, that's like honor. Worth of the mind or mind worth is honor. In this case, it's plural, honors. So here we have another one, earth, which is earth, and shrefa, which is like cave or, or, or dwelling, I guess, an earth dwelling, an earth cave, an earth hall. So what would an earth hall or an earth cave or an earth dwelling be? I'm not going to answer that for right now, but I want to ask you to think about it. What is an earth an earth cave? Look out for this word. It appears in places like the wife's lament, for example. This next one is Hron Hrade, or whale road. What's a whale road? Again, this is something I'll answer for you later, but what, what would you think that refers to? What is the metaphor there? This appears in Beowulf, so you may see it soon. And then this last one, Gold Gifa. This one, gold, gold, and gifa becomes giver, right? So gold giver. Who might a gold or what might a gold giver be? Who might a gold giver be? What might that be referring to? So that's something to think about as well. Or maybe you'll see a phrase like ring giver, gold giver. Hmm, who are they, who are they talking about when they say ring giver or gold giver? Something to wonder about. But Kennings are really a great example of the way in which Anglo-Saxons loved wordplay. They really enjoyed this wordplay, this ambiguity where you don't just come right out and say something, but you find this poetic way of describing it metaphorically that makes people have to think about it. This was a highly prized poetic technique. And the next two conventions that are related to each other that I want to talk to you about is our understatement and litotes. Understatement is just downplaying reactions. And usually we use it ironically or comedically. So like if I just had a beautiful gourmet meal, maybe at um, Gordon Ramsay's restaurant in Las Vegas or something, and then I'm like, yeah, it wasn't bad. What? What are you talking about? It was delicious. Or you're like, yeah, it wasn't bad. It wasn't the worst meal I've ever had. That would be an example, right? It wasn't the worst meal I've ever had. What are you talking about? It's a delicious meal. Or if you win the lottery and you're like, yeah, it's okay. What do you mean? It's way more than okay. It's freaking amazing. That's total understatement. Or a person experiences a major trauma on a day and they they say, it wasn't my favorite day. What do you mean? No, it was like the worst day ever. So that's understatement. You've, you're familiar with this. So there's a specific kind of understatement that the Anglo-Saxons really enjoyed. And that particular kind of understatement is the litotes or the litotes. And the, the key there is that you're using a negative or a double, double negative, essentially, to mean a positive. I'm not unhappy if you win the Super Bowl. I'm not unhappy means I'm very happy. I'm not unhappy. Yeah, because you're happy. You're super happy. Or if you are a Shakespeare PhD, as someone who studies Shakespeare, and you say, I'm not unfamiliar with Will. No. Nah then that means, you know, I'm, I totally know everything about him, right? That's a, I'm not unfamiliar with the bard, if I were to say it that way, <laughs> which I totally would. All right, so, or maybe Unferth messes up something easy, and Beowulf says, sheesh, it ain't rocket science. And, you know, that means that was so easy. Why'd you mess it up? It's not rocket science. Um, so, uh, or like after the vi villain dies, his fatal departure was regretted by no one. <laughs> so that means, yeah, good riddance. We're all happy to have you. So that one, yeah, t keep, keep your eye out for it. All right, here's a convention that I mentioned before, but I need to bring it up again because it's just so very important to the Anglo-Saxon poetic aesthetic. Ambiguity we looked at, we saw in the riddles. We saw an example of how they like the wordplay and to not have everything spelled out for you so that you have to kind of think about it a little bit. We're going to see that a lot more with the elegies. The elegies in particular, which are the Wanderer, the Weiss Lament, and Wolf and Adwacker. The elegies really focus on giving you some details, but not too many. They want to give you enough that you get a sense for what's going on emotionally, but maybe you don't need to know every single detail of motivation. In the example we have here, we have, First my lord went hence from his people over waves rolling. She doesn't tell us why. We don't know why. We don't know why the husband or the Lord left, why they left from their people, why they left over the waves rolling. We don't get those very specific details. We just get this more generalized statement of what happens that allows for a broad range of interpretation, allows for people to have different ways of thinking about it, and requires that playful, poetic riddling, trying to figure out what's actually going on there. So you see that 
same playfulness in the ambiguity, whether it's a riddle or an elegy, or you're, you'll see it in other places as well. Speaking of elegies, elegiac verse is also a convention that we see throughout poet, Anglo-Saxon poetry, even if it's not specifically an elegy itself. But the quote that I have here then is from The Wife's Lament. I'm singing this song about myself, very sad. An elegy is a is a lamentation about loss, right? It's someone who's mourning the, the loss, whether it's a loss of a person, of a life, of a lifestyle, whatever it is, you're mourning the loss. And in some way, this writer in The Wife's Lament is mourning the misery that she endured. So this is kind of, this is a lamentation about loss. And you'll see that throughout other genre or other poems as well, even ones that aren't strictly elegies. Like you'll see elegiac moments in Beowulf. One of the conventions of elegiac poetry in particular is a specific motif known as the ubisunt motif, which is means where are. It's a lat it's Latin for where are. And you can see here that sometimes there's literally like a where is something. So where did the steed go? Where is the young warriors? Where it, where is the horse? Where is the young warrior? Where is the treasure giver? Where where are the seats of fellowship, right? Where are the halls festivity? It doesn't have to literally be where are. You can see, alas, bright beaker, alas, burnest warrior, alas, pride of princes. Notice how there's a repetition there. Notice how that it's doing that variation thing, right? Where did the steed go? Where did the young warrior go? It's the same thing, but there's a slight variation. So Ubisunt is an example of a way in which they use variation. So how the time has passed, gone under the night helm as if it never was. So this idea is like, where are the things that I used to have? Where is this good life? And time brings an end to things. Time takes away the things from us that we wanted to have and makes us mourn. That's part of the Ubisunt theme, the where, where has it gone theme. Finally, we have one last convention, gnomic wisdom. And no, I don't mean gnome as in a garden, little dude with a hat and cute little red hat and a beard. No. So a gnome in this case means a maxim or a short pithy statement of truth. Like all that glitters isn't gold or don't judge a book by its cover or things like that, right? We have we have gnomic wisdom or maxims that we still say now. So fate is firmly set. We see that's from the wanderer. A wise man must be patient. Not too hot of heart, nor hasty of speech, nor reluctant to fight, nor too reckless, not too timid, nor too glad, nor too greedy, <sighs> never eager, eager to commit until he can be sure. There's even a kind of poem called Maxims or Gnomic, Gnomic Verse that basically intertwine statements about the world like frost must freeze or winter must come. <laughs> frost must freeze or, you know, the fox must chase the rabbit, like, like, things like that, nature things, trees must lose their leaves, and they intersperse them with things about human behavior. So like a king must rule, a wife must take good care of her husband. So there, that that's a way of generating social norms then if frost must freeze, like there's, it's true, you can't stop frost, you can't stop things from freezing once it hits a certain temperature. And if that's true, then a king must rule his people must also be true. So there's like, by analogy, it naturalizes the social behavior by placing it in, in context or in juxtaposition with uh, the rules of nature, which cannot be circumvented. So this is a few different literary conventions for you to think about. There's one more thing I'm going to be telling you about literary conventions in the, in the next piece of this. But for now, this is a lot for you to think about and uh, consider as you continue to read and as you read Beowulf.